go to the Lord in prayer. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. God, I pray that you would rebuke Satan from around this place. God, we plead the blood of Jesus over this message. God, I pray, Father, as we come together this first Sunday of this year, I pray, Father, that we'd worship Thee. And Lord, I pray that our worship today, Lord, will carry on throughout this year, not just on Sunday, but every day. Lord, let us remember You. God, let us remember Your humble beginnings. God, let us remember Your your prosperous life on this earth, God, that we too, God, in these last days that we live in, Father, that we would, Lord, that we be faithful to you, to serve you, and God, be faithfully about the Father's business. Help us now this morning, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll title our message this morning, simply the life of Christ, the life of Christ. Now, we've read to you the story of his beginning, and we've preached to you the last two Sundays on his beginning, his birth. Uh, what happened after Christmas, the visitation of the wise men. But let's go over those just a second. Jesus was called Emmanuel, God with us. Now, friend, people, sometimes people cannot get past the fact that Jesus came as a baby in a manger and they leave him there. But this baby in the manger was Emmanuel, meaning God with us. God came down to us. In the form of human flesh, God came down to man. And we, if you saw Jesus in his earthly body, he would look like a Jewish man. And that's what it, somebody said, what did he look like? He looked like a Jewish man. What does a Jewish man look like? Well, study history, you'll see. And so he looked like a Jewish man, yet he was without spot and without blemish. I think Jesus was a man of, uh, a man of all men. I think he was... Uh, was a real man's man, so to speak. And I don't believe he was, a, you know, sometimes people paint him as a, you know, as a, uh, a gentle something that, you know, that had no manliness about him, but I believe he was a real man. And uh, he came into this world, his earthly beginnings, God with us, came in the, in the form of human flesh. We know that he was born in a stable in Bethlehem. We know he was visited by the wise men. We know he had to flee to Egypt. Why did he have to go to Egypt? Why did the angel come to uh, Joseph and tell him, you take the young child, the mother of the young child and take him to Egypt? Why? Because a wicked king named Herod was jealous over, over uh, a young child that he was told will grow up and be king. And, uh, and he killed all the, the children from the year two years old and younger. So we know Christ at that time spent... Christ in, in his age frame uh, fit into that two years old and younger. Somewhere in between there was Christ when the wise man came. And now listen, when, when Herod did that, uh, Joseph had taken his family down to Egypt because the Bible said that he, that he would come out of Egypt. And so he took him down to Egypt and while he was down there, Herod didn't last long. Herod didn't live long. You don't, listen, you don't go against God and you don't, you don't rebel against God like that and live for a long period of time. And that's what happens to many folk today. Uh, they rebel against God, and God don't leave them here. Uh, saved or lost, God, God many times will take them out of this world. So Herod rebelled against God, and, and, uh, he t and, and Jesus, you know, it was known that Jesus would come back because he was also a Nazarene. 
So he didn't last long, and here comes Joseph, uh, well, the angel with the news to Joseph that he had uh, died, that Herod had died. So what did he do? He took, uh, he took Mary and the baby Jesus, which is a young boy by then, took him back to the city of Nazareth so that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, uh, we, we look at all this and we see his earth, early life and we see that uh, the last we know of him as a teenager was that he was age 12, almost teenager. He was found sitting in the temple with great wisdom and great knowledge and he was teaching the doctors and the professors and they were asking him questions and he was able to answer them and they marveled uh, at his teaching. Uh, this was a very common family, I believe, because they had made their journey uh, they had made their journey, and on their way back, all the company of people were together. And, and Mary and Joseph, actually, they left Jesus behind a whole day's journey. And they thought it was with some kin folks, And so they got to inquire where he was at, and they realized they'd left him behind, so that they went back and found him there uh, teaching in the temple. And so uh, they gathered him back. Have anybody ever forgot your child? That's the most scary, scary experience that ever has been. Has anybody ever done that? Well, I guess I did it just so the Lord would let me use it for an example for this message. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, if a preacher can, you can. I could tell it on somebody else I know that left their teenage, uh, teenage child at a gas station on vacation and thought they were just being real quiet in the back, and they got on down the road a pretty good bit uh, before they called them on the cell phone and said, Where y'all at? And they had to go back and get them. None, nobody y'all know, I don't think. But anyway. But my wife and I, when Amber was just a, a, a young child, how was she? How old was she, honey? Three or four years old, maybe. Uh, we went to church. We were going to Brown's Chapel then, and uh, we went to church. And we was over there, you know. And we had church, and of course, mom and daddy always, you know, they was bad to hold on to their youngins and, and keep them during church. And so uh, we thought they were with her, <coughs> with my mama. And so uh, we got out and we headed up Sugar Cove. And we got up to the coat and we looked for Amber. Amber walking with mom and daddy. She said, I thought she was with you. I said, no, I thought she was you. So, <coughs> well, not a big, big, big deal then. You know, everybody looked out for everybody. So we went back down the road. There come one of her neighbors bringing her young to us. But you think about a terrifying experience. You leave your young somewhere. You know, it ain't like you lost your dog, Amen. It ain't like you left a book somewhere. Get your child. And so Mary and Joseph, disturbed as they were, they went back and, and, uh, and they found Jesus teaching in the temple. So that was the early life of Christ. And then, <coughs> Frank, you'll have to edit that out. Hey, Amen. I'll get rid of this minute. I got too hot. Uh, but you can edit all this out. You can put your thumb on that somewhere where you do, and I'll be through here in just a second. But, as, as we see his earthly life, we see him to the age of 12 years old, then it's silent for many years. You don't hear about him. You don't know what is going on. Well, I'll tell you what's going on. The world could not contain the books if they were written to explain the life of Christ while he was here on this earth. And friend, I'm, I'm certain that when he reappears in his earthly ministry to us, <coughs> begins I'm certain that uh, Jesus was very much about the Father's business uh, y'all pray for him this is not the way I intended to start this year <coughs> but I'll get through it if I don't we'll all go home early and you know what I'm going to preach next Sunday <coughs> okay so if we Turn to the book of John, or the book of Matthew, chapter number 3. I'll just try to calm it down a little bit. <coughs> In verse number 13, we see, John, we see Jesus re-entrance as we know it. John saw him in chapter number 1 in verse 29, and this is an account of that. But it's a different account as Matthew gives it. We see John saw Jesus coming to him while he was baptizing. Remember, John was down baptizing in the River Jordan in a place called Bethbara, and he was down beyond Bethbara, and he was down there baptizing. And he looked, and he saw Jesus coming across the way. 
And what did John say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now, Matthew presents this same story here. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, where John to be, unto John to be baptized. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus he becometh us to fulfill all rights as then he suffered him. Now, John baptized Jesus in the river Jordan. I've been to that place. The first time in, in many, many years. I think I, I, we went with uh, 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 the Sexton Ministry Tours to, to Israel. And on the way over there I said, Can we, are we going to go get to see the place where Jesus was baptized in Jordan? Because that's been my life's verse. Behold the Lamb of God. And I said, can we go see that? And they said, well, <clears throat> I don't know. This tour's only been there one time in the last 50 years. It's been closed down, been fighting all around. And, and there were minefields everywhere. He came back to me a little while later. He said, you know what? He said, I think we're going to get to go down there for the first time and second time in all this ministry. I think we're going to get to go down there. How about having me a shouting fit? I'd been praying the whole time. I've never, listen, now, this preacher never been out of the United States except Canada and Mexico. Never flew on an airplane. I thought, Lord, if you let me fly over there, please let me see where you got baptized and where my life first took place. And so we, we got down there and he said, yeah, we're going to get to go. And we drove down through there and I got pictures of it. And on both sides was minefields where you couldn't go where there were still <clears throat> active minefields. But we got down there, and they, they built a nice place down there, and it wasn't open to tourists yet. There was a few down there that didn't allow it in. And we got in there, and I got to see the River Jordan where John baptized Jesus. Again, I like to have me another shouting fit. Amen. Hey, friend, it's real. Amen. It's real. This, what I'm reading to you, is not a fairy tale. It's not just some story you find in the book. What I'm reading to you this morning is real. And we ought to get excited about the reality, amen, of a living Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. By man. Oh, my friend, I'm glad that Jesus came. John baptized him, and in these next three verses right here, the next two verses right here, we see a manifestation of the Trinity all in these two verses. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God. There we have Jesus, there we have the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove and lighted upon him. And then we hear the voice of the Father and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. So Jesus starts out, he's baptized like he was said he would be. And then we find in, in Matthew chapter number 4, we find the first thing that happens in his ministry that we know of in the book of Matthew is that he is tempted of the devil. Now let's read this. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I dare say there's no one in here that has missed uh, meals for 40 days and 40 nights. Certainly I have not. And you can look when there and see the evidence that I've not missed that many meals. But Christ, he, I've been two or three days, you know, fasting and, and uh, my body got weak. But can you imagine after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting how weak Christ must have been physically? You say, now he was God. He was, listen, he was God man. Remember, he was flesh. He was, he was God in the flesh and certainly he was hungered. The Bible tells us here that he was afterward and hungered. So the devil comes to him when he is in this condition. Now that's the, the way the devil does. He, he kicks you when you're down. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he is tempting Christ that, you know, if you're, you're hungry, I know you're hungry, and I'm going to try my best to make you do something you don't want to do. So he said, if, if, if you be the, just turn these stones into bread and, and uh, you can eat, you can have the food that your physical body craves. What did Jesus say? What did he do? Did he say, okay, and did he do it? No. 
Listen, he was being tempted because he was tempted like as we are. Amen. Like as all of us are, he was tempted yet without sin. So he was tempted with hunger. But he answered and said, how did he, how did he say? It is written. He answered the devil with the word of God. I want to tell you something. If the devil's on the attack, you have the same thing that Jesus had when he was fighting the devil, when he was fighting temptation. You have the word of God, and I encourage you, if you're being attacked by the devil, amen, respond to the devil with the word of God. He can't take it. He can't take it. He, and here's Jesus said to him, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we see that the devil tempts Jesus, and Jesus uh, re, you know, rebukes him with the word, and he does not fall to that temptation. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and sitteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now the devil's a wily devil. And he is a devil. I hate him. I, 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 like I said the other Sunday, I hope when it gets time for him to be cast into the lake of fire that God gives me somewhere on him to give him a boot. Amen. Because I hate him. He's never done anything good for me. He's not done anything good for you. He's a devil. And so the devil tries to use God's, own, God's word on God. And he said, look, he said, you know, you cast yourself off here. Uh, you're not going to get hurt. And, 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 and we're, I'm tempting you to do that. So Satan uh, 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 attacks when Christ is weak. Remember, he hasn't eaten for 40 days or 40 nights. But Jesus overcomes these temptations. He, he tempts him to do a dangerous act. What does Jesus say? Jesus said to him, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So what does the devil do? He has to offer again. So see, he doesn't give up easily. When the devil is tempting you, he does not give up easily. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. <clears throat> I don't know what you might be facing. I don't know what temptation you may be facing. But Christ, when he, uh, you know, I, when he started his ministry, he started out with a life being tempted. And friend, I'm telling you today, if you're doing your best to serve the Lord, you are living a life of temptation, and the devil does not give up. Now, there's some things the devil never tempts me with because he knows I'm not going to... I succumb to that by the help of God. I'm not going to do it. It's not, it's not anything in my life that's a weakness. But, God, but the devil knows my weaknesses and that is where he attacks me. Sometimes it's emotionally. You know, sometimes it's, it's mentally. God attacks you and he attacks the mind. And the only way to get relief over the attack of the mind, you know, when you're sitting alone, Driving down the road in your car, minding your own business. Maybe you're singing a song that's on the radio, a good gospel song on the radio. All of a sudden in your mind enters something that you hadn't thought about in a long time that worried you a while back. And you get to pondering on that thing. And pretty soon, if you're not careful, the joy of the Lord exits and the fear of the devil moves in. My friend, I've been there and done that a whole lot of times. And when that happens, all I can do is say, Lord, help me. God, help me. And I plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, help me. Because I have no other recourse. I have no other defense except the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and except pleading that blood. And guess what happens? Man, I hang on and I hang on and God comes back on the scene and he'll help me in here. Now, you don't listen. You don't have to be, you don't have to be doing anything bad to fall into that. That, that temptation of the mind. Whatever it might be, whatever might be bothering you, the devil beats you right up here. I've got a little track, if I can find it, that I preached a message out of a time or two, and it's, it's, the mind, it's called the mind under the blood. And friend, the only way to have peace and joy and happiness in this life up here is to have it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ answered the devil when he was tempted of that, and he he said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the devil doesn't give up, so he does something else. He leads him up to a high mountain. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Everything that could be had at that time 
He took him up there at the top of that mountain. I, we were up there too. And you can see forever. And you can see all kinds of things. And it's a long way down. And what did he say? And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. See, that's what the devil wants. He wants you to give up on God. And he wants you to follow him. But I'm telling you, friend, you started this journey with the Lord. Amen. You ought to finish it with him. Amen. Many Christians have succumbed to the temptation of, of, of following after, after self and after the flesh and after the devil and they've wound up, amen, leaving this world without a testimony because they didn't continue to follow God. I think I'll follow Him. I think I'll follow Him. I think it's worth following Him. Now I'll tell you something, I'm preaching this message and the devil's going to fight because I'm preaching the message. And he'll fight you because you're hearing the message. But make in your mind, I'm going to follow Jesus. And what did Jesus say unto him? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He said, Devil, get away from me. I'm going to worship God. And when the devil tempts you to do other than serve the Lord, when he tempts you to do things of the flesh that you know is wrong, when he, think, when he tempts in your mind, and you know you shouldn't be thinking the thoughts you're having, friend, I tell you, ask Jesus to help you plead the blood of Jesus and tell the devil to get behind you because, because you are going to worship God and him alone. And guess what happens when he comes to that place and the devil sees how determined you are and sees the blood of Christ in your life. Listen, then the devil leaveth him. Amen. The devil will leave if you let yourself go to the Lord. Amen. If you'll surrender to Jesus, the devil can't bother you for a while. Even now, he'll come back. He doesn't give up easily. He'll be back. But don't you once in a while just want a space of time where the devil just don't bother you? Don't you want just a space of time sometimes when, you, when your mind is at ease and when the devil don't, don't harass you? A friend, it's there. But look out, he'll be back. But when he comes back, remember, you've got a little more armor this time. You've got a little more resistance this time because ever the resistance is what causes strength. These big trees that grow on the mountains that grow deep into the ground and they stand the winds of time and they never fall down and some of them stand for hundreds of years. You know why? Because they have resisted the winds of time. And when those winds of time blow against them and those storms come against them, they dig the roots in a little bit deeper and they're, with, and they're able to withstand the storm. Because they have weathered the storm. A friend, it's going to happen. It happened in the life of Christ. He was tempted. While he was hungry, he was tempted. But he resisted temptation and he used the word of God in his defense. So if the devil's fighting you, amen, just plead the blood of Jesus. Say, Lord, say, oh devil, get behind me. I plead the blood of Christ. And God will give you help. So we see this. This first point here was that he was tempted like we are tempted, yet without sin. And then we see here that as Jesus' ministry begins, what does Jesus do when he first starts out? After his temptation, after that he's fasted, after he has <coughs> beat the devil, so to speak, with the word of God, what does he do? He begins to preach. He begins to tell others. He's about 30 years old now. All that time between 12 and 30, we don't know exactly what it is. But he began to preach the word of God. He began to preach the gospel. He began to tell what Jesus would do for people. The ministry should always be to preach the gospel. My ministry here at the church, my mindset here at the church is to preach to you the Word of God and always include that message of the gospel. The message of good news to man. The message that Jesus will save whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. If I miss that, I've missed out. But yet if that's all I ever preach to you, then you won't grow much. But if I preach to you messages that will try to encourage you and include how to be born again, then someone's here that's lost, they're going to know how to get to heaven. Amen. I want everybody 
to get to heaven. If you're here lost without God, I'll tell you today that if you believe on Jesus Christ, you too can be saved. Now, you're not going to get away from the devil because he's always going to fight you, but you too can be saved and be sure of heaven. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe the gospel. That's what Jesus preached. He preached the gospel. Preached of his birth, his death, his sinless life, his resurrection, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you and I should be guilty of preaching the gospel. Preach, I'm no preacher. Let me tell you something. The word preach means to thunder forth, means just to tell it. And everybody in here ought to be guilty of preaching. Amen. Women included. Now, I'm not talking about I get in trouble of that. Somebody's going to hear that on the internet. They're going to hear that on Facebook. Well, that woman believes in women preachers. Amen. I believe that women as well as men should put forth the truth of the Word of God. That's what I'm talking about. So all people out there about to get on me for saying I believe in women, women preachers, I'll just tell you just exactly what I believe. Amen. I believe they too can tell the gospel. Amen. Now let that sink in for a little while, all right? I'm going to leave it right there. Let, let people say what they're going to say. I'm going to leave it right there. But let me tell you something. Everybody should be guilty of proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. We should preach the gospel. That's what Christ did. When his ministry started, that's what he did. He preached the gospel. I believe he preached it plain and straight. I don't believe he cut no corners when he was preaching. He, when he was talking to the Pharisees, he called them a generation of vipers. He called them devils. He, called, he told it like he was. Friend, I don't believe that a man of God that preaches the word of God can preach the, the whole counsel of God without telling it like it is. Amen. <coughs> From creation to the end of time, I believe you've got to preach the whole counsel of God. And I believe that's what Christ did. I believe he told it like he was. And my endeavor to you this year is to tell you like it is according to the Word of God. Now, I don't expect to get in the flesh and come up here and rant and rave over things that don't pertain to our day or don't pertain to the Word of God. But I do intend by the help of God to preach you what thus saith the Word of God, just like Christ did. He preached the Word. The Bible tells me to preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, re rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. So it's all in, contained in the Word of God. But Christ did. He preached the gospel. In Mark chapter number 1, verse 35 and 39. And in the morning rising up, a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and therefore prayed, or there prayed in Simon, uh, and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go to the next towns, into the next towns, that I may preach therefore also, for therefore came I forth. You know what he was? He was the first missionary of the gospel. Christ was. I believe in missions. You all know that. I believe we ought to spread the gospel to the next towns, to the uttermost part of the earth. I believe it's the church's responsibility to spread the gospel and tell the good news. And if you can't do it, I believe it's our responsibility to, em to em empower those that can to go do it. Amen. That's, that's why we support missions. But Jesus was the first missionary. And what did he do? He went and preached the gospel. Then last of all, Jesus begins to call his disciples. You follow along in the scripture and you follow along in the gospels and you compare scripture with scripture and he begins to call men into service. He calls men to preach. He says, you follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Oh Lord, help us to be fishers of men. And I don't know that there might not be a young man in here somewhere listening to me this morning. Maybe, you, maybe I don't think you are, maybe you are, maybe... Maybe God's dealing with your heart at a young age, or maybe it'll be later on. But I, there may be some young man in here this morning that God's dealing with about preaching the gospel, or is going to deal with about preaching the gospel. God's calling is without repentance. 
I know some preachers right now that had to get out of the ministry because they messed up, they fouled up. And I talked to him, talked to one just a while back, and he said, Preacher, it still burns in me, and I can't do nothing about it. Why? Because the calling of God is without repentance. There may be someone that God's.